so today's devotional is uh, something that has encouraged me personally, and I pray that it will encourage you. So a few days ago, I was uh, sat in the garden one evening making a fire in my fire pit. And I was sat with a load of uh, paper recycling. So lots of little sheets of paper from uh, school books and stuff that we don't use anymore. And I was burning paper. And it was a very long job and you never stopped because you set a piece of paper on fire and you put it in the fire pit and you are going to be quickly putting another one in because after 30 seconds, although it's a very bright hot flame, it does go out really quickly. And so as I was sat upright on my chair, ripping pieces of paper off every three seconds to try and get a fire going, I was very worn out from doing it in the end because it's a non-stop constant job. Even when I put big wads of paper on there, it's such a small fuel that it burned up really quickly. But then I started putting wood on the fire. First of all, a few little chunks of wood that I found, and then a big log that I found. And the log was burning for a very long time, and it gave me a lot of warmth. And after the log had been set on fire, and the embers were burning, I could sit in the garden really warm, even though it was a bit cold and wet outside, and not have to worry about putting little pieces of paper on top of it to keep it going. So the point of this, when I was sat there doing this, I thought, how often do I do this in my prayer life? I give little bits to God. I pray here and there. I pray for help, or I pray for guidance or wisdom in the situation. But how often do I put a big log on my fire? This is all allegorical, obviously, um, but it's a good point, really, because how often do we spend a decent amount of time with God, praying, reading the Bible, worshipping him? Uh, especially now that we're all at home, we have time. I know we have. I've got four children. You know I haven't got time, but we make time for God. So instead of putting little bits of paper on the fire, I've started to try and put a log on the fire, where I give more than half an hour of time of reading the Bible and praying to God. Some of you might already do this, and that's great, and I encourage you to carry on. But uh, what I was spoken to by God in this time when I was putting little pieces of paper on the fire is it's not a, it's not a sin to talk to God all the time in little ways. It's quality over quantity, but also it's important to give your quantity to God along with the quality. So it's easy enough to, like I said, to pray little bits here and there, but set time aside for God. Not just today on a Sunday for the, the hour long service that we've got planned, but throughout your week, as I preached on in December last year, we worship in the spirit. We don't have to be in a physical place in order to worship God these days. We can be wherever we are. And wherever we are right now is home. And so, when you're at home, I encourage you, as I'm going to do, to sit and read your Bible and pray for a decent amount of time. And I do believe it will help us all in our lives and walk with God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you are always there to hear us, even though our prayers are sometimes short and sweet and we only read a chapter of your Bible or a few verses to keep us going throughout the day. Lord, help us to remember that you gave your all for us and that for us to set an hour aside a day for you is nothing really. Pray, Lord, you do help us to read your word with wisdom and love and any questions we have that you will help us to answer them. I pray, Lord, as you hear our prayers, let them be prayers that are according to your will and your purposes. And Lord, I pray once more for the church that you protect us over this harsh time, that you help us all to love one another, even from afar. And for those who are sick, particularly those who have got COVID, I pray, Lord, for your protection, your healing and your love to be saturated in them, Lord, right now. Amen. OK, so I'm going to be reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This week I have been on my knees for our little church and as a result the Lord has brought me to Psalm 23 that our dear sister Ella kindly read out for us earlier. It is a psalm that was written over 3,000 years ago yet is known verbatim by literally billions of people today. It is often referenced in popular music 
in Hollywood films and is the go-to psalm for many of life's most important occasions. Psalm 23 is the psalm that everyone seems to know. But do we really know it? Yes, we can all recite it. Many of us know these words off by heart. But are these promises that we read here, are they in our hearts? Psalm 23 is overflowing with the most wonderful and important promises for us all to cherish as Christians. It speaks of the relationship between us, the sheep, and the shepherd, the great shepherd, which is a huge theme throughout the entire Bible. Sheep are mentioned over 500 times in Scripture, shepherds over 200 times in their various forms. And this relationship between the two, the sheep and the shepherd, is encapsulated here in these short yet most profound words of Psalm 23. Each line of this psalm contains the signature of its author, David, who, as we know, was a shepherd. In 1 Samuel 16, we read of the prophet coming to Jesse's house in Bethlehem a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And he came looking to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And Jesse, he brought out his boys, all strapping young lads and all up for the job. But the Lord does not see as man sees. And the prophet Samuel, he asked Jesse to bring his youngest son in from the field. The field where David was out learning his trade to be God's anointed king by tending the sheep. David, the great king of Israel, he wrote this psalm understanding the intricacy of the Bible's allegory between shepherding sheep and shepherding people, because David had done both well. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, David wrote Psalm 23, understanding the depth of relationship required between shepherd and the sheep, between pastor and his flock. And most importantly, we read here that David confesses his own need for a shepherd who is of course, God, God himself. And we see this need repeated throughout scripture. In Genesis 48, Jacob refers to God as his shepherd. Isaiah does the same in Isaiah 40, verse 11. I would like you to listen carefully to these most wonderful words of his here. He refers to God saying he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Aren't they beautiful words? God tells Ezekiel that I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. God is the great shepherd, which is why David can say so confidently at the beginning of Psalm 23 that the Lord is my shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And it is these five words that I want us to look together at today. 
So let's begin with the word shepherd. Shepherd. Now we all know what a shepherd is and what a shepherd does. The good shepherd, he does not run when the wolves come in to attack, but he stands in the narrow way and he protects his flock. The good shepherd knows his sheep by name and they come to him when he calls them. The sheep are the object of his love. And when one is disobedient and wanders off thinking that they know best, it's the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to catch the one that's gone astray and bring them back safely into the fold. The great shepherd lays down his life to protect the sheep. He becomes the lamb who goes silently to slaughter on behalf of the others. And the only person that we see in the whole of scripture who encapsulates these attributes of the good shepherd is, of course, Jesus, Jesus himself. He is this great metaphor incarnate, which is why I believe that the term shepherd here is strictly a messianic term. So when David proclaims here that the Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah is the word that he uses here for Lord. He is actually referring specifically here to Jesus in the Godhead. He is saying Jesus is my shepherd. Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, but God the Son. Jesus is my shepherd. For he came to this earth to seek us his sheep and only he died for us his sheep and the father refers to him as my shepherd jesus is god the father's shepherd isn't that amazing god the father says himself in zechariah 13 7 awake sword against my shepherd against the man who is close to me declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Now this is a prophecy that was fulfilled in Peter's denial of Jesus in Matthew 26, 31. Jesus is God the Father's shepherd. God also says through Ezekiel 400 years after David lived. He said, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. Now, David had been de dead about 400 years at the time of Ezekiel writing this. So this passage is not pointing back to David, but it's pointing forward to the Messiah, Jesus the Christ the root and descendant of David, who will reign forever and ever. And right now, Jesus does reign forever and ever and ever. He reigns in heaven, the lamb upon the throne, as it says in Revelation 7, feeding and fulfilling his people with his love for an eternity. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is the shepherd, the shepherd of heaven and of earth. He says it himself in John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. And friends, the shepherd and the flock, we belong together. Yes, at times, we, the sheep, can wander off. We can go astray. But friends, the reality is we are only safe when we are close to the flock and under the shepherd's care. Which brings us 
to the most significant word for us to consider today in our reading. A word that has eternal consequences for us if we do not understand it correctly. And this word is the word my. The Lord is my shepherd. My is a personal pronoun that denotes ownership. We read here in this psalm, Psalm 23, that from the very outset, David makes a claim to own Jesus. He makes a claim of owning his saviour. And this claim is a claim that saves. Friends, it is one thing to know Jesus as a shepherd. It is one thing to know that he is the metaphor incarnate. Or to know that he is good and kind and loving and that he gave his life to save. But it is quite another thing to know that he did all of this for you. It is quite another thing to say that the Lord is my shepherd. To sing with the hymnist, mine, 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 I know that thou art mine. Saviour, dear saviour, I know thou art mine. Friends, this is the challenge God has placed upon my heart to bring you today. A challenge that determines your eternity. Friends, can you say with all confidence that Jesus is my shepherd? That Jesus is my Lord? That Jesus is my King? Do you believe in him? Do you trust him for your salvation? Can you hear his voice today through his word preached? And are you willing to submit to his leading over your life? Do you know that he is your good shepherd? who is with you every step of the way to lead and to guide you through absolutely anything you might face. Can you say, the Lord is my shepherd? For this is what saves. I will close with these wonderful words from Psalm 78 that reads, he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the wilderness. He guided them safely so they were unafraid. Psalm 95, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice. Amen.
goodness will lead.